Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Today I'm talking to Luis Pedro Coelho. Luis is the principal investigator of the Big Data Biology Lab at Fudan University in Shanghai. Luis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Roman. Glad to be here. I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. That's, uh, that's very nice to hear. So um, we're here to talk about NGLS, which is a domain-specific language for uh, next-generation sequencing data processing. Uh, so give us an elevator pitch. What is NGLS and wh why we might want to use it? So NGLS is, uh, as you said, a domain-specific language. So this means it's not a complete programming language. So we're not trying to do the same as, say, R or Python. Uh, we are just focusing on the problem where you have some NGLS data um, and you want to run some pipeline over it. But as you're probably aware, there's a lot of variations within this process. And so we have a what's a programming language to specify this. And our research hypothesis was that if we had a language that was focused solely on this problem, we could have a better user experience in the end. And so when we can go over what we mean by user experience, but mostly we're focusing on making, making things reproducible, making things easy for the user, um, giving them good error messages, and And we think that we can do this better in a controlled environment of a domain-specific language versus the the um, the uncontrolled environment, so to say, of of a language that's that can do anything, a general-purpose one. What are some examples of the tasks of the analyses that uh, you typically use Angelas on? So right now we've been heavily focused on metagenomics. So And this is whole genome sequence metagenomics, where there's either you have, say, especially if you're working in an environment that's very well studied, for example, you have some human gut metagenome samples, then a lot of what you can do is reference space. That is, there are references out there published by many people, uh, including some where I've been a part of. And you can, you can start by pre-processing your data and then mapping it against these known references. And this this can mean many things. Uh, and then summarizing the results in some way. So this would be the type of analysis that currently is very well supported. And using that analysis as an example, uh, can you explain, like we're using a domain-specific language, uh, and, and specifically NGLAS, like what benefits it can give uh, over the alternative workflows? So one, one thing we would like to do is give the user uh, good error messages. So I think a lot of tools work very well, but they fail very badly. And by this, I mean, when they work, they work. But when there's a problem, when either the input data is, is not exactly as they want, or when the, the user makes a tiny mistake, you know, just misspells a command line option or misspells a path, then the tool will will not help the user solve that it will provide it will provide a very hard to read error message this is a very typical case it will fail silently it will output a result that's incomplete or wrong and so there is where i think we can do much better uh, so for example we do a lot of checking uh, even before we start the pipeline so let's say the pipeline has five steps conceptually And step number five is going to fail because step number five requires that some resource be available. So in a typical general purpose programming language, the system would have to run steps one through four, and then at step five, it would fail. Uh, in our system, we can, we can check directly that, that the prerequisites for step five are not there. And this can mean you know, things as simple as step five writes the output to a directory and the user has misspelled the name of the output directory. So he has, they have specified a directory that does not exist. So by the time it reaches step five, the, the program will fail. In a general purpose programming language, it's impossible to know that 
that this directory would not have been created in one of the earlier steps. Um, but in our system, we actually know that that's impossible. And that distinction really reminds me the distinction between more static versus more dynamic programming language. So for example, in, I don't know, maybe in Python, if you call a function with the wrong number of arguments, then you won't find out until that function is called uh, compared to a more static language like C++ or Java, where that those checks are performed before the program is run, right? And that's not a coincidence because you also uh, use this uh, static analysis, you use um, static typing, right? Yes, that's correct. And our types are not the standard programming language types, although we do have those, but some of our types also correspond to to things like um, a, f a set of fastq files. So those are those are built-in types. So we also have the traditional, you know, we have integers, we have strings, but then we have a type for that represents the conceptual idea of a set of short reads, which corresponds to a set of fastq files. And the language is typed, so the types are all. In you don't spec you don't have to specify types because they can be inferred because the language again is is fairly limited, but but we do we do a lot of type checking yes. And what was there a specific time uh, a specific occasion where when you got frustrated with the existing tools and how how did the decision uh, to create your own language um, was uh, made? Yes, it was. It was initially we were frustrated um, with the, especially with the possibility of making of making very simple mistakes, and the tools don't really check. Um, so, a lot of these uh, workflow tools, including you know the traditional Make, but also a lot of the more modern ones. Basically, you have a set of files, and maybe at best you have the extension providing what type of file it is right so the, the so if you have something that's a .txt then you can assume that's a text file if you have something .fq you can assume that that's a fastq file but that's the extent of typing in those languages and so it's very easy to make mistakes uh, and this situation where your pipeline runs for 5 hours and then fails at the last step because you've mistyped the output directory I mean, this has happened to me hundreds of times, and it's always very frustrating. So, at at some point, you know, at some point, this frustration uh, turned into okay. The computer should have warned me about this, and we should have better systems. And and so then, then this morphed into a set of discussions uh, with other people, and eventually we converged on the idea of okay, let, let's try to do something on a on a much more limited space and see if we if by limiting our domain area we can do better so let's take that example um, of doing metagenomic profiling and uh, obviously on the podcast it's hard to give a code listing but walk us on, on the high level walk us through the uh, steps that we would have to make in angeles in this programming language to perform that analysis and how, how would that roughly look like in this programming language? Okay, so probably you could actually start with some of the examples or the profilers we already provide. So for some of the standard analysis, you could just start with what we have um, and it's described in the paper. And so, it's, so you can start from that um, and either use them as is or start tweaking them to your use. and. What they do is, so they, they start by loading the fastq files that you provide. And, and then this is another thing that's done always automatically, is we run some basic fastq statistics on them. So, so again, the user does not have to specify this type of, an, of process as a separate um, step in the pipeline. It's done automatically. So by statistics, you mean things like read length, read quality, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, and we and we we output uh, you know some very simple graphs and diagrams. Uh, you know, I, I think m most most people who work with fastq files are are used to seeing this this um, this type of statistics on the qu quality per base 
um, per base position, etc. So that's the type of statistic we provide. And then you pre-process the, the data, so you can trim the reads based on the, these quality scores. And again, again we calculate the statistics after the after this trimming. So you know, so you can see, for example, how many of your reads were were discarded uh, after trimming. Um, you can you can also set the thresholding to say, you know, if the read after this becomes too short, we know you want to discard it. Um, then you, you can do things, for example, if you're working with, say, samples from from a human-associated microbiome, uh, we often want to throw away any human-related reads, so we can start by mapping them to the to the human genome with BWA, for example. Right. So let's let's maybe walk through that part. So. How does that look like in your programming language? Do you have to specify the whole command to BWA, or uh, or is it just a function call? It's just a function call. If you do not want to specify anything um, in term, so if or if you want to accept all of the default parameters, it, there's a function call called map, M-A-P. It takes two arguments. It take, the first argument is this this set of reads that you want to map. And the second argument is what you want to map against. And here you have two options. One is you use some internal references. So for example, the human genome is a reference that's known to NGLS. So you can use, so if you just specify that you want to use HG19, it knows that you want to use the human genome and it will automatically download it for you if, if it's the first time you're using it. Or you can pass your own FASTA file if you have one uh, and then you pass it as a file path on disk. And what if uh, I want to provide some extra arguments to the BWA or even use a different aligner? So if you have some other uh, arguments that you can specify, and including you, there's a, a shortcut where you can then specify directly arguments that will, so you just specify a set of strings and they will translate directly to a uh, to command line arguments that are passed to BWA. So we do we do have a couple of other aligners. So min, Minimap two is also built in um, to to use a yet another aligner. You would have to then extend NGLS. I mean, so internally the way this works is an aligner kind of like a in an object oriented system. So you have this aligner interface where where an aligner has to to know how to create its index and how to transform fast Q reads into SAM files. But as long as you can provide this interface, then it you could extend it to other aligners. So conceptually it's not so hard it's not so hard, but the ones that are built in are BWA and Minimap too. Mm -hmm. And so invoking that map function, it gives you like normally if you would do that in a terminal, it would result in a uh, let's say a BAM file that you can later process with other tools. Now yes. in NGLS, what is the return value of the of the map function, and what can you do with it? So the return value is conceptually it's a BAM file. Um, again, we 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 compute some statistics on on that BAM file. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, so we'll we'll compute how many reads were mapped uh, automatically. There, so there's some tricks here. So there's some things. So, so conceptually, we run the map. We run the map. Runs BWA, produces a BAM file, and then we compute statistics on that BAM file, and then you can post-process it. In practice, some of these things are internally optimized so that they're done as a stream, so that the the intermediate files do not actually exist on disk. Right, but on the other hand, some people who think about the performance of their system, they may be confused and concerned. Like if you have a function returning a BAM file, does that mean you hold the whole BAM file in memory as a data structure in your program language? And that's not the case, right? No. No, that's a and that's a that's a difference to compared to more traditional programming languages. So a lot of our data types correspond to files on disk and not data structures in memory. Right, so when you pass values 
in your programming language, they are, in a way, references or pointers to things on disk. And then you go one step further and say, well, they may even not exist on disk, but they may be streamed, right? And so there's no need to keep the whole thing on disk um, completely, but it's consumed at the same time as it's being produced. Exactly. That's So the intuition is that we're always generating a lot of these intermediate files, but we the user can think about the process in that way, but as an optimization, some of them don't actually exist. Okay, and then let's say you get your BAM file. Uh, what are some things you can do in NGLS with a BAM file? So for example, so if, if you had mapped your metagenome against the human genome, now what you want to do is actually throw away any of the reads that map. And here, map, you can even, you probably want to specify what you mean exactly by mapping. So BWA is very, very sensitive. So, so you probably want to say that you want, and we've benchmarked this a little bit, you probably want to say that you want to throw away anything that mapped as long as that mapping is at least 40 or 45 base pairs long. Um, because the very short map, the very short uh, hits to the genome, they're, they can you get a lot of false positives there, but you can say, okay, anything that's 40 base pairs or longer that map to the human genome, I want to discard, and then I want to convert this BAM file back to a fast queue file. And then, so the, and then you continue processing with now with a set of reads that are not coming from the human genome. So if you want to specify those specific rules, like what to regard as being mapped, does the language allow that flexibility or do you have some predefined uh, ways to, to specify that? Uh, the language allows that flexibility. So you, you can specify fairly complex rules because you you specify, um, you have, you write, the, uh, you know, and again, it's not a lot of code. It's, it's a few lines, um, but you can say for every, for every mapped read, you know, if the read, if the mapping length is above a certain threshold, then do this, else do that. Uh, so, so, so you can specify all of these thresholds in different ways and, and combine them, include, combine them in different ways as well. So can you somehow specify, like, do you have access in the language? Do you have access to the various uh, SAM file columns? Can you inspect them to create these rules? Y yes. So no, yes. So there's uh, not not just the columns. Some of them are, so the read, so the length of the, so, so the length of the hit of the mapping, that's actually, you actually have to compute a little bit from the cigar string but you can you can access that you can access the flags using um, uh, so you don't you don't act, you don't have to remember what the what the flags are so you don't have to remember what bit number three is you you specify it as you know as a mnemonic that's human readable right so so that's one advantage of having a domain specific language for NGS data processing right because in a general purpose language. Um, if you don't intend it to be used specifically for bioinformatics, you would have support, let's say, for tab-separated files, but then uh, you would have to do all the parsing and interpreting yourself. Yes. Okay, so where we stopped was uh, we have now filtered out the reads that map to, uh, let's say, a human genome, and we have a filtered set of, uh, of FASTQ reads. Now, in your... Um, metagenomics profiling workflow, what, what do you do next? So next you can, for example, get a taxonomic profile. And so here we have, you can use uh, tools like Motus or Metaflan. And, and so those, those are also available. Or you can map these reads to a gene catalog. Uh, so we also have, some of those are, again, known references, known references in and so when I say known references, so they are not bundled with NGLS, but NGLS knows where to download them. So, so the first time they're used, 
they they get downloaded and cached on the on the user's uh, computer, and then and then they're reused so that the user doesn't have to specify you know you don't have to specify URLs you just specify this mnemonic. Uh, so if you specify, for for example, for the human gut sample, you would specify IGC, which is the integrated uh, gene catalog, and NGLS would download it. Uh, both the catalog itself, which means you know, basically a big FASTA file, but also some annotation files, so that later you can you can map the reads to the catalog, post-process the BAM file uh, as before, where you say, okay, this is what we consider to be a good hit versus versus not, and and later also summarize these results. So, for example, you might say, I. I want to look not at the individual genes, but to get a profile of how many genes mapped into each individual um, orthologous group uh, of some sort, or in each individual go term, uh, and so that you get a summary at the more functional level. So we so we can get both taxonomic profiles through Motus Metaflan type of tools, or more functional profiles by mapping to a gene catalog. Pretty cool. And so it sounds like you have a very decent support for metagenomics because that's the field you yourself work in. But what if someone wants to use it for another NGS analysis? So things like RNA-seq, CheapSeq, variant calling. Does that make sense to use NGLS for, for those tasks? I think it does. Um, so I, I know some people at least have tried it because over the last, since the paper came out, which is now going to be um, about a year, I have gotten some emails of people saying they they're doing it and asking about it. So, a, as you said, most of the focus on metagenomics is mostly derived from we were doing it and we were using it internally in our metagenomics data. So, a, and a lot of the effort on integrating tools uh, and integrating references did come from metagenomics. But a lot of these other, you know, utilities of processing FASTQ files, processing BAM files, they could be used for other, for other NGS uh, applications or as part of uh, other NGS pipelines. Yes, it's more of a community thing. It's the commu rather than a technical reason why the why the focus on metagenomics. Right, but if someone wants to use NGLS for a task that it hasn't been used before. Inevitably, there will be a, a tool that they need to call that is not integrated in NGLS. And so can you talk about the uh, various ways in which NGLS can be extended to support new tools, new workflows? Oh, yes. So there's two main ways. So the first way is you can obviously fork the code and and write new code that supports it and that will give you a lot of flexibility obviously and you can use all of these tricks we were talking about of pre-validating and and turning things into streams so that intermediate files don't actually exist etc and then and then there's another way where if you specify if you specify a tool using a yaml file so that's a text format file where you specify what um, what the tool is? So you give it you give it a name that can be used inside the NGLS language, and then you specify how to call it on the command line. You you can specify um, arguments, including def having default parameters. Then NGLS will will use it uh, and will call it, and and you can then you can then get an extra function within NGLS. And you still get some of the advantages and some of the some of the normalization uh, from is done automatically. So, f just to give a silly example, but this is this is the sort of minor thing that minor friction that sometimes trips people. Let's say you have a tool that processes fast Q files, and for some reason your tool supports gzipped files, but does not support any other type of compression. And the user has files that have been compressed with bzip. Uh, so in this case, NGLS can do all of that uncompressing, recompressing on the fly 
for the tool so that the user doesn't have to specify this these extra steps um, and maybe it introduces a little bit of extra computation but from the point of view of the user conceptually if they have at some point in the pipeline they have fast queue files then and this other tool takes fast queue files this should conceptually this should work for the user and so if there's some internal format conversions NGLS does all of that internally but in order to do that when you specify your tool in a YAML file, you have somehow to inform NGLS that this tool supports these compression formats, maybe using these particular flags, and the other ones are not supported, right? How, how do you do that? Yes, you have. So by default, we, as, we are very conservative and we assume that the tool does not support anything except the, you know, except the basic, uh, in this case, the basic fast queue file uncompressed. And then you can say that it does support gzip, or it does support bzip2, or it does support xz. But if you don't say anything, NGLS will helpfully uncompress it for you. And another thing we do, uh, and this comes back to domain-specific languages, is whenever you run NGLS, it asks you to cite a list of a list of uh, references. And so this includes, uh, obviously we want people to cite our own paper, but this also includes any other tools that that are used in the pipeline. Oh, that, that's very cool. So if you if you use BWY at any point, then it asks you to cite BWY. If you use um, Metaflan, it asks you to cite Metaflan, or if you use Motus, it asks you to cite Motus. And if you specify an, another tool as a YAML file, then you can also add a field saying, okay, if the user used this, please ask them to cite this paper or this preprint or, you know, there's, it's uh, be because I think this sometimes happens where tools get subsumed within larger pipelines and then the original author, author don't, don't receive credit anymore. So I'm, obviously we cannot force people to cite it, but at least we want to make sure that, you know, it didn't get lost in the jumble. So if, even if you're using a pipeline that was written by someone else that used some third person's tool, we can still propagate that information and say, you know, please do cite this this author because they've contributed something. Yeah, that, that is very true. Yeah. Uh, and one of the static analysis you mentioned, one of the static checks is, for example, checking that if a, a later stage of the pipeline needs some file, that that file is produced by an earlier stage. How do you do those checks for these user supply tools? Uh, is there a way to specify in the YAML file, like what, what are the files that uh, a tool consumes and produces? Uh, so there's two, two things. So one, one, yes, so the, you can specify that this is an input file of some sort that needs to be present. Uh, or I think you can also specify, you don't specify output files um, per se. Uh, and the other thing is you can specify some code. You can just say you run this script and then, you know, it's a bash script that can, you know, internally do whatever other checks you wish. But you can, so you can say if the user is using this tool, then before anything is run, please run this initialization slash checking script. And if that script outputs an error, then the process will stop there. Okay, but that's a dynamic check, right? But what about static checking? Can you be sh can you check those uh, invariants or those properties that uh, if a file is requested later, it, it is produced by an earlier tool? No. So this check is done before it's done before interpretation. So the so the, there's two steps. NGLS th takes your script. Um, and you know it does it does it parses the script and then it runs all of these checks before it starts interpreting the script so my my scenario is this uh, let's say i made a typo in in the name of the file or i, I renamed the file in one place and didn't rename it in a, in another place yep. right and so my um step 1 for example runs for i don't know 2 days uh, yes. let's, let's say it's a, it's a genome assembly. It runs for two days. It outputs um, a set of contexts. And then the second step, 
uh, should take those contexts, but uh, the the file name is wrong there. Can can you cha- can you catch that mistake? So in in that case, so in ng, so in that case in ngls, so and we can do assembly or we call we call mega hit and then so you don't so the contexts again the contexts are an object in ngls so they they represent some some files on disk so but those would be checked you know as as types so you have so if you have a, you have a variable within the ngls script that's to which you assign the output of assembly and then for example you can later use it as a target for mapping uh, and in that case in, in that case yes if you had somehow misused the name of the variable then it would have been caught mm-hmm. i see so so i guess your answer is you don't work directly with files and so that's why you don't have to think about file names but you work with these higher level variables in your language right yes the only we work with files if they're input files. So if you if you're if you have a later step that uses say the assembly fi- the assembled files, um, and and say you had some other previous assembly and you're running some tool that does some comparison, for example. So now maybe your assemb- your initial assembly runs for a few days and then afterwards, you want to take those contigs and and somehow compare them against another path on disk. So you, if you if that other path on disk was flagged internally as this is a this is a input path, then this is checked right at the start of right before interpretation. So even before assembling, starting the whole assembly process, NGLS would check: Does this file exist and is it readable by me? So if there was some typo or permission issue, it would say, "Okay, I cannot run this pipeline because you know at 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 line fifty seven, um, we I will fail. And how hard is it to add new types to Angela? So it's it's cool that it knows about contexts, but let's say the latest file format that someone invented, like maybe GFA or uh, some format that hasn't been added yet by by you. How hard is it for other people to contribute new file formats or new um, types? Yes. So. That's now it's not so easy. Um, so we do, you do have to write, um, you do have to write new code internally. So right now internally, the, the list of file formats or the list of types is a fixed list. Um, it's, it's, an, it's basically an enumeration type um, within the language. So you'd have to, you'd have to do it as a, as a proper fork of the code and you know and contribute it as a pull request right and uh, if you wanted to do that uh, then uh, i mean not not you luis but uh, if if the listener wanted to to do that they would be perhaps a little bit surprised maybe pleasantly maybe not so <laughs> because the um uh, the language the angeles itself is written in is not your typical python or ruby or even Java, but it's uh, it's a language called Haskell, not to be yes. confused with Pascal. Uh, and so, why did you decide to use that language? And uh, yeah, what benefits do you think it it confers? So, the initial decision again was somewhat driven uh, more by community than by technical reasons. Although there's some technical reasons, so there's there's a big overlap between. The, the group of people who work on domain specific languages and the group of people who work with haskell or on haskell for example for parsing the language it's incredibly pleasant there's i mean if you if you've worked with some of these things before you you know that there's these these concepts of you have a grammar you specify a grammar of the language and and you even have some tools where you specify the grammar in in one you specify the grammar and they generate C, C or C++ code for you. But within Haskell, there are tools where you specify the grammar within Haskell and and it really looks like pseudo code, except it just runs and, parses, and does the parsing for you 
uh, efficiently, and and it's very it's very nice. Uh, and then, then having said that, there are other reasons why, for example, Python would not be appropriate. So, in particular, just just efficiency. Uh, so some of some of these some of these um, operations where if you're say looping over a big BAM file and every and for every uh, line of the BAM file you're processing some in, you're processing some logic on it. If you implement this in Python, it's going to be slow. Uh, and so we wanted something where you have s at least some compilation going on. Uh, so it couldn't be just an an inter a, a language that has just an interpreter. So it was a mix of these two things, and then and then inertia plays a role. So once once we had this initial version of the language implementation, which was which was working, um, you know, it's then then you can you keep improving it. Sure, um, but I think one concern when using Haskell is that not so many people know it, and it's not the easiest to learn language. And so the concern is it makes harder for other people to review your code or to contribute to your code. Have you have you noticed anything like that? And how, how many contributions from outside uh, people do you get? Yes, that's, that's definitely a concern. Um, so we have had maybe fewer contributions. We've had... Uh, we have had more contributions of things around the code, so including, and this is also why we have this facility where you can, where you can specify extra functionality just using a YAML file as opposed to having to write Haskell. Uh, so I think core Haskell contributions have been maybe three three people have done it, uh, and then we've had some minor things here and there from from a larger group, but a lot of these. A lot of these projects, you have a long tail where you have a very s small number of core contributors. Um, but yes, Haskell does pose um, some sort of barrier. And then especially, you know, being API, you don't want to write all the code yourself. You want to take some PhD students or postdocs and make them write the code for you. So how hard <laughs> is it to find people to work on a Haskell code base? And do you typically find people who are already familiar with the language or do you have to teach them? Um, so I've only been a PI for a short time and, and actually now we've, we're in a bit of a weird situation as all of us because of the, um, so you know we're all working from home so it's been a bit different. Um, we, so we haven't found that many people who know Haskell, we found some. Uh, sometimes there are people who, who don't know but know some other language in that family. So uh, some standard ML has popped up a couple of times, for example. People say, oh, I, I don't know Haskell, but I know standard ML, and so I think I could learn it. Would you advise someone who is getting into bioinformatics, uh, would you advise them to, to learn Haskell? I would not advise them to learn Haskell if that's the only programming language they're going to learn. So I'd probably advise them to learn Python first, um, uh, maybe. But, but I would actually advise if you, if you, um, if you know programming and you, and you know Python and you know C and you know C plus um, plus, so you've you've got your basic stuff down, um, then maybe learning Haskell, even if you're not going to use it, I think it expands your thinking. If, even even if you're then going to be writing it, not writing Haskell, but writing Python, it does expand your thinking a little bit so that I've noticed that the way I write Python has changed now that I also write Haskell. So you become more aware of concepts like, is this pure? Um, can I separate IO from, from computation? And even even when I'm writing Python, I think more about those things now. Maybe this didn't make sense for people who don't know Haskell, but in Haskell, you you have to be strictly separate when you are doing pure computation. That is, when when you are computing a function where the inputs uh, determine the outputs, and that's all the function does. It's so it's a function in the mathematical sense, 
versus when you have a computational subroutine where the subroutine can do anything, including performing I.O., where I.O. is could be reading files, writing files, printing text on the screen. And it, so in Haskell, this is a this is a fairly strict separation. And I think it's useful to 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 have that in the back of your mind sometimes even even if then you're not writing haskell so i'd recommend that people learn it as a you know as a, as a completely different language uh, i mean because it, it, if you know python and uh, and you're say oh well, i'm going to check out how ruby looks like it's not going to expand your thinking in the same way that's true that's true uh, now, another focus of NGLS is reproducibility. And I think you have pretty strong views on reproducibility. So can, can you talk about that? Yes. So so my views are are that, and, and you know, I can, linking back to this idea of, of a, a pure function. So I think that, that the outputs should depend only on the inputs and the code as much as possible. So the so I I'm, I'm not sure we're a hundred percent there yet, but our ultimate goal would be that if you have an NGLS script and a data set, then when you when you take those two together, that determines the output completely. So that there's no free variables left. And so we've done a few things already. Uh some and these are very simple design decisions, but for example the so the script uh, is versioned. So the, actually the first line of an NGLS script is always the word NGLS, and then you specify the version of NGLS that you want to use. And then if you use any other um, modules, so then you, they're also versioned. So you say, I want to use this, so if you, this reference version 1.0 or 1.1. And so this this means that if I if I have a script from you, for example, um, that script will will specify. Um, so because even NGLS has already changed a few times, some some of the internal behaviors have changed, but that script will specify which which behaviors it wants. And in at least one case, um, we even do things in a slightly wrong way to to. To reproduce the, to reproduce the behavior of an old version of NGLS. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So, can you defend that point of view? Like, if you have a bug in NGLS, instead of fixing that bug, I think do you advocate for like supporting that bug for that specific version? Like, if the user requests that version of NGLS, and you know that the result produced by that version of NGLS is wrong. And I don't know what, what you think. Is is there a degree uh, separation there? So if it's just a little bit wrong or is it disastrously wrong, would you approach those two situations differently? Yes, those situations are approached differently. So one thing we never do is we, ne we, we do never change the behavior. Uh, so there's two options. One is we say we refuse to run it. We say, uh, we say um, this this version is no longer recommended, so please do not use it. Uh, and we will, and you need to update the version. So, at least now we're not producing wrong results, but we're also warning the user that that they shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so we prefer explicit errors to silent behavioral changes. And the other. The other case is where we we give a warning. We say this version is not recommended, but we're still going to give you the old results. And this was a bit of a judgment call because the it's it's a bug. It's a bona fide bug because the logic is wrong. But it's a it's a case that in our experience happens less than a million in one, and and so this is also why it took us so long to figure it out. Uh, so we were running it for for several years before we realized that there that there's this edge case that's handled wrong, and so the while it's not defensible that we should use the old behavior in practice, 
it's a rounding error. You cannot, you know, if you're if you have if you have a data set with a hundred million reads, which maybe fifty of those will be handled slightly different in one version versus the other. So we're so in that case it's a judgment call that it's probably better to still give the user the old wrong results uh, rather than to upgrade, although we do warn them. And other cases what what the behavior is is the the newer versions of the interpreter refuse to run if you ask for an old version. And there are also a lot of changes that are different. So where, for example, where we've changed, say, the default value of some API. Uh, so these were there, there were some API errors in the sense where we we had one default and then we realized that the user almost always wants the other one. And so in that case, th this is a different type of bug because the, then they use we we realize that the it's the API that's that's wrong. And so in that case, we can change the language and change the API, but still preserving the old behavior for, for the previous users. Yeah, that makes sense. And then there are cases where the downstream tools that you're, well, not downstream tools, but um, the tools you're invoking, they may have some randomness inside them. Yes. So they're using some random seeds and hopefully they allow to set to pin those seeds to specific values. But usually people tolerate uh, slight changes. I mean, it may be a bit annoying, uh, or e even maybe not. Maybe some people view this as a an additional check, uh, an additional sanity check. So if from run to run, you have drastically different, you get drastically different results that uh, tells you that something is wrong with your analysis. Um, so can you make a case for the perfect byte for byte reproducibility compared to like rough reproducibility where the results are m like mostly the same and result in the same statistics? Yes, I do think that we should try to aim for byte for byte reproducibility. So in practice, I found that that most people are actually uncomfortable if the results shift a bit, uh, even if qualitatively it's it's the same. I think it's actually hard for users to. So, if you have someone say that they've done their analysis and they've produced some some plot where they show you know some some biological result, and and then they they rerun their analysis and and the biological results change but but the plot has changed in a way that that it's it's noticeable that it's no longer exactly the same thing what i found that is that people end up then s storing and saving all their intermediate files on disk so that this doesn't happen uh and that people are a bit uncomfortable for for example say you submit a paper uh today and then the reviewers say, "Oh, this is good, but can you please just, you know, do this little tweak and show the data again in a slightly different way?" And people rerun their analysis, and now the plot looks different enough that you can that even though the message is the same, you can see that the results are not the same. I think, in my experience, people are actually uncomfortable with this. Uh, so end users do become a little bit worried um, that this is the case. And I've also heard this argument that you know it's actually kind of a sanity check, um, and I think there's some validity to that. But it's also it it is a pretty you know, it only catches the most egregious uh, of cases. So yes, so if so if your results depend on the random seed, then yes, this will be caught if you just run it with a different random seed. Um, but I would still prefer if that was done in a more controlled fashion, where you're saying, "Okay, if I want to, I want to run this with different random seeds." Then you explicitly do that, rather than rather than relying on on it as a side effect of the fact that that our systems are not, you know, cannot achieve reproducibility. So I think there's some, so I think there's some practical advantages to reproducibility this perfect reproducibility where you can confidently tell users or including yourself as a user 
that it's fine to throw away all of the intermediate results because you know as long as you have the data you can get them again because in the results and the data are equivalent to each other just give just given more computation and i think that this argument that it provides a sanity check is actually uh, weaker than it seems it only catches the most egregious of of you know of dependencies fair enough uh you also brought an interesting topic of let's say plotting um so i i'm wondering how you approach that let's say i run my analysis then i want to generate some plots maybe in r uh, yes. or, or python so uh, would you advocate integrating that R code somehow with NGLS uh, tracking its versions, or how would you approach this? So so far, and and what how we see it is, so we see this second uh, step as as a separate step. So we, so most of the analysis have these two steps, where first you have this initial computation where you are still handling the raw reads and s somehow computing some derived matrices and in the second step where you're doing more data science type of work where you have some data matrices where typically you have samples in one dimension and some sort of features on the other dimension and i think this requires different tools i actually think that it would be great if there were more domain specific languages for uh, for this type of work rather than rather than uh, Python or R I, or even if they're embedded within Python and R if some I think this it would be great if we had uh, more data science more data science uh, domain specific programming language I think there's I think there's a space there for someone to do a cool thing but it's not NGLS it's a, it's something else it's a data data science slash plotting domain specific language Fair enough, but one could argue that ggplot, for example, is an embedded domain-specific language for, for yes. plotting, or dplyr is an embedded domain-specific language for data manipulation. Yes, those those are those are those are good examples. Yes. So let's compare NGLS with uh, other tools, roughly in that space. So one analogy that comes to mind is because NGLS is managing sort of workflows uh, of like other programs being run, then it's maybe in roughly the same space as uh, the common workflow language, CWL, or uh, you know Nextflow, or even tools like Make or Snake Make. Um, yep. So yeah, how, how would you say NGLS uh, compar compares to those tools? Is there any, um, is there ever any reason to prefer those other tools to NGLS? Um, oh yes, I mean obviously those tools are general purpose. So if you're working, you know, if if you're working in a domain that NGLS doesn't cover, you should use them. And I think this is the trade-off: is those tools are uh, achieve, you know, cover a much broader domain. Um, and I and I think, but I still think that if you're working within the smaller domain that we cover, we can provide a better user experience. So I think this is the trade-off that that we from the start of the project the project has bet on is that by by covering just a tiny part of the problem space we can do better than a general purpose tool but obviously a general purpose tool you know can do much more and then another area which is is very close to what you're doing so you're doing metagenomic profiling and then there is the 16s profiling and we have uh tools like uh, chime or mother there um, so, what are your thoughts on on those tools, and can uh, NGLS uh, compete with them? So, I th okay, I, I'm not an expert on 16s. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of knowledge that you have to have when you work with 16s data. So, uh, I don't want to risk saying something that um, the experts will say will say is very ignorant. So, I, I normally try to stay away from commenting on out of a out of a respect for the amount of knowledge that that there that's necessary when you're working with 16s data i think there's a lot of specific uh specific knowledge that you need to have about how uh how you know how how your sample processing in the lab and the choice of 
primers and the choice of uh, sam uh, sample processing interacts with how your analysis is going to work and how, and all of those things I um, I don't feel confident commenting on. Right, but those expert choices, they concern the specific pipeline, the specific workflow. But yeah. if one of those experts would want to recreate an environment similar to Chime with Angelas, would, would there be anything preventing them from doing that? Are you looking forward to uh, competing with, with Chime if uh, that community became interested in Angelas? Yes, that could. In that case, it could be an opportunity. Yes, if the, if there's someone who who does know uh, their their 16s processing and is and is interested in in trying trying to do something uh, with NGLS and then you know based on this same set of things where you know trying trying to get trying to get an environment that's re that's reproducible that produces uh, a good experience for the user that that re um, then then yes, I think there's an opportunity there, but I would I would definitely need someone who knows there's you know there's sixteen s sure. Is there anything we haven't talked about that that you would like to mention? No, I think this has been great so far. I mean, um, I mean i I welcome if people want to try it out and uh, and give me feedback. Uh, I mean, as I said, I think I think the general concept of doing more domain specific languages, I think it's still a bit underexplored. I think there's a lot of opportunities, uh, and we've we've seen some. You're right. Uh, so ggplot, uh, even some of these fancy machine learning libraries uh, that we see nowadays are often a kind of embedded domain-specific language within Python, where you specify where you specify a computational graph uh, rather than actually computing something. But I, th I think there's still more space for us to explore to explore this possibility of can can we do better with domain specific languages than trying to do everything in python and r okay Luis, uh, it's been great uh, i encourage everyone to try out angeles on their next uh, ngs analysis uh, project and thank you for being on the podcast oh thank you roman